Hello everyone, welcome to today's session of the course The History of English Language and Literature. Today's lecture is titled The Carolyn Period or the Age of Milton and the Interregnum. So we begin to see the last leg of English Renaissance in this lecture and we also note that more than the literary and non-literary events, it is the political and religious events that dominate this period. And we also see the end of English Renaissance. So, in that sense, it becomes very important to take a look at the socio economic and political background as well. As we have been doing in the previous lectures, we will be giving a detailed background of the political turn of events, which led to certain kinds of implications and certain kinds of eventualities in terms of art and literature. So, here we go, beginning to see what the Carolyn period or the interregnum means. This was the period of King Charles I who ruled from 1625 to 1649 after his father James I. And this age particularly has many kinds of definitions and it can be described in multiple ways in uh, social terms, in literary terms and also in uh, political and economic terms. This was the age of Puritanism and this was also the age of Milton in terms of literature. And this age was dominated by the political tensions between the King Charles I and the Puritans uh, who also comprised of the parliament. This was also the period of the English Civil War which lasted from 1642 to 51. And around this period we also see the end of Renaissance theatre and also this marked the death knell of uh, Elizabethan and Jacobian theatre. The theatres were closed in 1642 with the beginning of the Civil War. We also see the Cromwellian revolution that follows and Trevelyan rightly describes this period as the England of Charles and Cromwell. And we also see the interregnum, the period that follows was known as the interregnum from 1649 to 1659. So, this was a quite a turbulent period and we also begin to see that many of these political and uh, social religious uh, uh, events of this time it had a lasting implication not just on the literary uh, phases of England, but also on the way in which the state itself began to be conceived and constructed in the uh, following decades and centuries. But in spite of all these events and in spite of the turbulence and difficulty of these times, we also see that England continues its colonial expansion and it continues in a rather uninterrupted mode. And this is quite uh, uh, significant to note because we do not find the growth of colonialism getting hampered either by the internal or external factors. With this, let us move on and look at some of the prominent figures and some of the prominent groups that feature during this period. For this, it is first important to take a look at who Charles I was. He lived from 1600 to 1649 and he has gone down in history as the only English king who was beheaded. And what led to his downfall was his own belief in the divine right of kingship and also his uh, stubborn insistence on absolutist monarchy. And in that sense, the downfall was his own making. And all of these beliefs in the inherent uh, rights, divine rights granted to the kings, he had uh, got it from his father who also was a staunch believer of absolutist monarchy. He was the second son of James I. However, he was not the first choice for the heir apparent. He becomes the heir apparent only after the death of his elder brother Henry Frederick in 1612. He, he, he caught a mysterious fever and he succumbs to death. And so at the age of 12, Charles I becomes the heir apparent of England, Ireland and Scotland put together. Until that time, it said that he was uh, considered as a very uh, weak prince and uh, James I was not even sure whether he would make it to adulthood. So, since he could not, uh, since the family thought that he may not be able to survive the travel from Scotland to uh, England for a very long time until uh, he was 12, until he becomes the heir apparent, he was raised in Scotland. And it is also said that when he moved to uh, London, he was a very shy kid and he also did not know how to uh, uh, he did not know the ways of the world and he was also considered as uh, quite weak and it said that he worked quite a lot in order to improve himself in terms of his personality as well as his physique. And also George Villiers who was uh, the Earl of Buckingham and uh, 
uh, initially James' first close friend and later who becomes Charles' closest advisor, he played a huge role in uh, preparing Charles I to assume the assume kingship at a later point. And there is this interesting uh, information about uh, George Villiers, Earl of Buckingham. He was considered as a very close uh, friend of uh, James the First, and there were also a lot of rumors about a homosexual relationship between James the First and uh, George Villiers. Jo it was James the First who made uh, George Villiers the Earl of Buckingham, and there was this gossip in London during those times about uh, their relationship, and people used to uh, whisper that Queen Elizabeth was a king, and now King James is a queen. So, in spite of that, George Villiers' powers grew enormously and we do find him continuing as Charles' closest advisor when he was crowned king in 27th March 1625. And once he becomes king, we do not find him uh, lingering back in anything. He is no longer the, the shy kid who arrived in uh, London at the age of 12. And by May 1625, this is marriage alliance that happens with Henrietta Maria of France. She was also a Roman Catholic. So, this was perhaps the beginning of an ongoing struggle between uh, Charles I and the English people because England was predominantly a Protestant state by then and they were increasingly enraged by Charles I's alliance with Henrietta Maria of France who was of uh, the Roman Catholic faith. So, Protestant England was unhappy right from the beginning of Charles I's rule and this was not just it. There is a long struggle that ensues the details of which we will be taking a look at shortly. And now we need to take a look at who the Puritans were. The Puritans were the ones who uh, began to be uh, forged as a community from the reformation period onwards and they were the ones who were dissatisfied with the religious settlement accomplished in England and they also maintained that though the Church of England had managed to break away from the Church of Rome they maintain that the Church of England did not differ sufficiently enough from the Church of Rome and in that sense they were the true descendants of uh, Wycliffe. They claimed themselves to be the true descendants of Wycliffe and the Lollets. Lollets were these uh, staunch uh, uh, believers in uh, whatever Wycliffe proclaimed and initially this term was used quite derogatorily and later on it became a descriptive term itself. And they were also influenced by John Calvin of Geneva. So, in that sense they were a group of reformed English Protestants who sought to purify the Church of England from its Catholic practices and they also maintained that the Church of England was only partially reformed that it was retailing some of the Catholic practices which were hindering the true practice of Protestant uh, faith. And they also had uh, showed a lot of hostility to the episcopal form of ecclesiastical government which was in place in England with the Protestant Reformation and they also thought that this was the remnant of popery which was part of the Roman Catholic Church. So, in that sense they were increasingly intolerant of earthly tyranny in any form and they also had very strict views concerning life and conduct. So, it also made them highly unpopular during those times and uh, regarding the term the Puritans, initially the term was used in derision and it said that the term came to be used uh, around uh, perhaps uh, mid 1560s about the year of Shakespeare's birth or shortly after. But however, this term uh, was soon after uh, accepted as a mere descriptive term without any derogatory reference. Though initially uh, the group began with a lot of intentions, eventually we find that they become their tenets become not that acceptable. Hudson has got a few interesting descriptions and observations about them. Um, Hudson the historian claims that the spirit when it was introduced was fine and noble, but it was hard and stern. Allow me to read a passage from Hudson. We admire the Puritan's integrity and uprightness, but we deplore his fanaticism, his moroseness and the narrowness of, of his outlook and sympathies. He was an intense and God-fearing, but illiberal and unreasonable man. His was a one-sided and unwholesome view of the world, for in his preoccupation with the moral and spiritual things, he generally neglected and often expressly denounced the science and the art, the knowledge and the beauty, which gave value to the secular life. Puritanism destroyed human culture and sought to confine literature within the circumscribed field of its own particular interests. 
So, this gives us a short summary of what Puritans did to the socio political and religious uh, affairs of the times and also it shows how it adversely affected the progress of art and literature during those times. Before we go on to take a look at the long struggle between the king and the parliament, we also need to take a look at the two factions that had formed in England during the reign of Charles I. So, there were two predominant groups, the royalists and another group which supported the parliament and the puritans. The royalists were the strongest where least socio-economic changes uh, had taken place in the last uh, one century, in the last 100 years. So, they also had this nickname cavaliers because uh, uh, they primarily, they, uh, they always uh, mounted horses and also they were seen as foreigners and bullies. And uh, the other supporters included uh, the church which also thought that the, uh, the king would help restore a particular kind of uh, staunch belief system. And they were also the royalists and the king were best loved in rural regions and uh, the areas which were least connected by commerce. So, in that sense the northern part and the western part of England supported the royalists and the king. And another section which, do which was dominated by the parliamentarians and the puritans they dominated in the areas which had great connection with economic changes and uh, uh, commercial uh, trade and other kinds of things happening. They were known as the, they were nicknamed as roundheads because most of them had shaved head and they were also seen as low bred and also uncouth and not so sophisticated like the royalists. And um, these were the group of people who also enlisted the support of uh, the London trading companies the manufacturing towns and districts and also they dominated in the, uh, in the richer areas of England, mostly in the southern and the eastern part. So, we also begin to see that though the royalists were considered as more powerful in terms of uh, uh, their nobility, in terms of the kind of powers they enjoyed because the church and the royalists were together, the parliamentary and the puritan uh, sympathizers, they were the ones who controlled the economy of the uh, nation. They were the ones who uh, ran the trading companies, they were the ones who managed the finance and the uh, colonial expansive activities could not have been possible without the support of the parliamentary and uh, puritan uh, sympathizers. So, in that sense we begin to see a very strong division and a tussle over here and also we begin to note that the royalists cannot uh, function if they do not get enough money uh, through the uh, parliament supporters and through the uh, traders and the uh, people who were running the commerce. So, with this we begin to take a look at the long struggle between King Charles I and the parliament. In 1625, Charles I is crowned as the King of England, Scotland and Ireland. And in 1625 itself in the same year, he begins to, his colonial ambitions begin to run very high and he thinks of waging a war with Spain. If you remember, James I, his father, he had already made peace with uh, Spain as soon as he had assumed power. So, this was not seen as a wise move by most of the, by the members of the parliament and the common people were also not ready to get into another kind of war because that also meant heavy taxation. But however, uh, with the support of uh, the Earl of Buckingham, who is also Charles I's advisor, Charles decides to uh, go ahead with his uh, uh, plans to annex Spain and he also calls a parliament for the first time, let us call it P1. The first parliamentary meeting happens in 1625, he summons the parliament to raise money. If you remember, most of the uh, commercialists of the time and most of the uh, uh, wealthy rich tradesmen and uh, company owners of the time, they belong to the uh, supporters of the parliament. And so, it was very important to enlist the parliament's support in order to uh, tax the common people or to raise money because there was no other way uh, through which the court could raise money from the commoners at that point of time. So, uh, parliament is summoned for the first time under Charles the first rule in 1625 in order to raise money for waging a war with Spain. But however, the parliament does not agree to this proposal by Charles the first and Charles the first resorts to his and here we find Charles the first dissolving the parliament for the first time. And this was no big deal in England during that time, it was not as if the kings had not dissolved the parliament at all. They, they, there were many other kings who dissolved the parliament and the parliament was summoned uh, time and again as well. So, it was not considered as a big deal 
uh, to uh, dissolve the parliament. And in 1626, even after he had dissolved the parliament, he realizes that there is no other way to raise money and he still hell bent on attacking Spain. So, he summons another meet which we sh shall call as P2. So, there is a second uh, parliament meet that happens and again the issue of taxation is uh, brought up and uh, we also need to keep in mind that we also need to keep in mind that Charles I was a staunch believer of the divine right of kings and he also thought that he had the divine right to assert himself and his ambitions on the parliament and the commoners. So, he failed to see the rationale in not going for war and he continues to insist on getting uh, more uh, taxes. But at this uh, point of time, there is also the emergence of this particular figure, uh, George Eliot, who asks, who demands for Buckingham's impeachment in order to raise more taxes. And because they also, they all knew that George uh, Villiers or the Earl of Buckingham was, uh, uh, had, uh, had become a profound influence on Charles I and there were ongoing allegations against Buckingham's influence in uh, all of these uh, uh, decisions and the policies of the state. So, uh, Charles I obviously does not agree to the impeachment of uh, uh, Buckingham and he also fails to restore uh, the confidence of the uh, parliament and we find him dissolving the parliament for the second time. And nevertheless, somehow uh, and somehow uh, Charles I summons an army, he also uh, gathers enough resources and he makes this uh, uh, war trip to Spain, but it was a huge failure. In today's terms, it could be considered as a um, multi-million pound worth fiasco. So, this uh, was a huge blow on Charles I's reign even as he had begun his uh, term as the king and when he came back to England, he was uh, met with an enraged uh, public and an enraged uh, parliament, but he was too arrogant and too uh, short-sighted to see where this was all uh, leading to. And also another important blow on Charles I's reign was that on 18th June 1628, we find Buckingham getting stabbed to death. So, this was a fatal blow to Charles I's uh, uh, reign and also to his uh, forthcoming plans. And by March 1629, we find him summoning the parliament again. We find the third time the parliament getting summoned and he also blames the parliament and particularly George Eliot for, uh, for, for stabbing Buckingham to death because he was quite shaken, Charles I was quite shaken uh, with this death that had happened and uh, but parliament in turn accused uh, Charles I of being too lenient towards Catholicism. If you remember the Catholic marriage had already shaken their trust in uh, Charles I's religious uh, tendencies. And uh, this almost enrages the king again and we find him dissolving the parliament for the third time. And meanwhile, Charles also achieves another thing. He also manages to uh, trap George Eliot in some case and he is also sent to tower. In that sense, he also thinks that he had managed to silence the uh, members of the parliament to a large extent because he was not the kind who could tolerate any kind of negotiation or any kind of discussion with the commoners. And with this, in, we enter a new particular phase in the history of England. So, meanwhile, while he was ruling England without a parliament, it was uh, uh, not a very non-turbulent period for him. Charles I assumed that he was doing a lot of things for England and for instance in 1638, he, he takes upon himself this mission of the restoration of monarchies. If we recall the history during Henry VIII's rule, he had destroyed a lot of Catholic monasteries because he wanted to wipe out Catholicism and bring in Protestant faith. So, Charles I wanted to restore all these monasteries and also he enlisted the support of the Archbishop of Canterbury and this was not taken very kindly by, uh, uh, by the English people because they did not want to go back to Catholicism in any way. But the Archbishop of Canterbury, he also had a religious agenda in supporting uh, Charles. He thought that this is perhaps the right opportunity to bring together the congregations of the religious congregations of England and Scotland together. And keeping this intention in mind, he also tried to introduce the Anglican prayer book in Scotland. 
but this uh, was not taken very kindly by the Scottish people and soon after this we find the Scots erupting in rebellion, there are riots in churches, there is also the bishops war that follows. Since that is not uh, entirely connected to our topic of discussion, we shall uh, quickly skip that. But this is again not seen very kindly by uh, King Charles and he is also advised by uh, his uh, new advisor who is the Earl of Stratford after the death of Buckingham. He is also advised by the Earl of Stratford that he Charles will be doing a mistake if he does not suppress the Scottish rebellion right away. So, in 1638 he decides to uh, suppress the Scottish rebellion and uh, we, he also realizes that in order to do this he also needed finances and that also meant summoning the parliament again because only the parliament could help him raise the funds. So, here we find him summoning the parliament. So, here we find him summoning the parliament for the fourth time in 1638 in order to again get more funds to suppress the Scottish rebellion. But this time in the place of George Eliot, another important parliamentarian had uh, come into prominence. John Pym and John Pym demanded the abolishment of ship tax which was quite heavy during the time because uh, uh, he Charles wanted this uh, money to support his naval expeditions and Charles obviously says no to this proposal as well and he also uh, dissolved the parliament he also dissolves the parliament again for the fourth time and what had given Charles the courage to summon the parliament and ask for money again. And this leads us to take a look at what had been happening in those 11 years when Charles I was ruling without a parliament. During those 11 years, we find uh, London in particular making a lot of strides in modernization. There are also uh, new roads which were uh, built in uh, London and also uh, uh, the rest of England. And we also find Charles uh, coming up with a postal service system in England. And he also begins to address the unemployment issues which also endeared him for a short while to the commoners. And uh, his major contribution in terms of architecture was, was the introduction of the European and imperial style of architecture in the city of London. He also uh, beautified his palace and his other residences in similar way. But however, though uh, some of those things were seen as benign and generous by a certain groups of people. In general, the extravaganza was not acceptable to the English public. Parliament also felt that he was being quite reckless in spending with the money of the uh, common people's tax. So, uh, even after the fourth meet, we do not uh, find the parliament and the king uh, able to be negotiate with each other. Though Charles had dissolved the parliament for the fourth time, he realizes that there is no other way for him to uh, gain resources without the support of the parliament. So, again for the fifth and final time the parliament is summoned. This is the final summoning of the parliament under Charles rule and this happens six months after the, uh, after the fourth meeting. This is in 1640. And this happens six months after the first meet in 1640. And we also find that the fifth and final meet happens six months after the previous meet in 1640 itself because there was no other way in which uh, Charles could uh, enlist the support of the London companies and also gain more finances. And at this time, the parliament also forces him to come to terms with the fact that the parliament cannot be, cons cannot be dissolved again without the parliamentarians concern and this marks a significant shift in the kind of relationships uh, the kind of relationship between the king and the parliament and it also marks the beginning of a long and deadly struggle between kings and parliament in uh, England in general and this is not uh, it's not as if it was a very decisive kind of a shift but we also begin to see that there was uh, the, the possibilities of negotiation, the possibilities of bargaining was coming down drastically. A significant point to be noted at this point is that the parliament never wanted to take down uh, the kings or, the, uh, or Charles entirely. They only wanted to bring in a balance of power. But since 
uh, Charles believed in the divine right of kingship and also in absolutist monarchy, it was very difficult to uh, negotiate with him. And this was uh, quite important because the later kings, uh, we begin to see that they do not display this kind of blind faith in royal absolutism or in uh, the divine right of kingship. So, the beginning of this long struggle between Charles and the parliament, it led to the event, led to the eventual thing which had to happen, the English Civil War and we also saw how two different factions had already been uh, formed due to the various other socio-political reasons. So, with this we begin to uh, wind up today's lecture and the next session we will begin to see how the English Civil War and the Cromwellian Revolution that followed, it uh, changed the history of uh, not just the uh, politics and religion of the times but also the literature of the period. And that is all we have for today's session. Thank you for listening and look forward to see you in the next session.